Riverdale in Clayton County. I'm Jason Rowland, the lead pastor right here at Living Waters International Church in Riverdale, Georgia. And I'm inviting everyone who ever will would like to come out on Thursday, June 25th at 10 a.m. right here in the parking lot where we're gonna be distributing 1,000 boxes of food to bless families and individuals in our community. That's on Thursday, June 25th at 10 a.m. right here in our parking lot at Living Waters International Church in Riverdale. Our address is 374 Valley Hill Road, Riverdale, Georgia 30274. We're across from the public library on the corner of Lamar Hutchison and Valley Hill Road. We want you to make plans to be with us that day on June 25th at 10 a.m. so that we can extend our love to you as a blessing with the box. In those boxes will be some meat, butter, cheese, vegetables and fruit, and milk in those boxes. So make sure to be here that day at 10 a.m. where we'll be distributing those boxes to you. Listen, here at Living Waters International Church, we want you to know that we are for Riverdale and we are for Clayton County. And this is a small opportunity for us to extend our love to you. We look forward to seeing you then. That's again, June 25th on Thursday at 10 a.m. See you then. International Church. Welcome to our live where we're interacting with you while you're watching this broadcast today. We're so excited. I'm outside the entrance right here or the side entrance at Living Waters International Church where we have eight more Sundays until we gather together here right here on our campus on Sunday, August the 2nd at 11 a.m right here in this building. We cannot wait till we get be able to return and get back together again. If I have found anything during this time is that we need each other. And so we're happy that we are announcing that we're eight Sundays away until we get back together. Today is a special day, but before I get to that, if you would like to give to the, the, the mission and the uh, vision of Living Waters International Church, please do so through Cash App, dollar sign, Cash App, at uh, LW Give, or you could also use Zelle Giving at Office at Living Waters TV. All the information is right here on the screen. That's Cash App Dollar Sign LW Give, or Zelle at Office at Living Waters TV. If you not had an opportunity last week to be able to see the interview that I did with Just and Gael and Kimberly and Antonio. I want to take a few moments just to show you a little snippet of a question when I was asking about the the feedback that uh, that white people are receiving whenever they're trying to give their um, uh, two cents into the things that are going on and give their uh, voice to what is going on with everything that's going on. I thought Kimberly had a great response to this, and I want to show you one snippet before we get into the teaching this morning from my wife, Karen Rowland. Take a look at this and watch when I ask this question about how, how white people are responding and the feedback or the, or the, or the back, backlash sometimes that white people receive when they're responding. Watch this right here, what Kimberly had to say. So uh, let me ask this, and this is probably one of the final questions here. All right. It, you know, one of the things that white people hear from black people in the last week was, white people, where are you at? Use your voice, speak out, things like that. Um, number one, when people say that, what, 
when people say that, when, when, when black people say that, what does that mean? And then let me also on the other end say, what I've heard from white people is, I have spoken out, but in this heated social media expansion, they have gotten knocked out for things they have said. And so it causes the person, the white person to retreat and say, look, I, ain't, I don't want to be out there and be controversial, whatever, you know, and things like that. And so, so that's back and forth. So what, when, when black people say, where are the voice of our white friends and where are the voice of our white people? Where, where's that, you know, what does that mean? And what do you want, what are white people expected to say or do? And then on the other hand, what would you encourage people who are speaking out? Uh, because social media is the beast in itself. Um, being vocal even within your within your own family, it can be a beast within itself when you're standing up for your family, I mean, for your friends who are of color. Uh, so, Kimberly, you looking up in the air like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess it just, you stand in solidarity with us. That's all it is. And be willing to take those punches. We're losing lives. You're taking punches. Mm. And they're internet trolls who, you know, I read people's comments and sometimes I say something positive back because as long as another person is willing to stand up for you, then, hey, that's all anybody's asking. Stand in solidarity with me. And yes, if you take heat from friends or family members or people who don't share your opinion, Take the time to educate them, but don't leave me. Still stand by me because, you know, I've seen some of the images, like the one where the uh, white officer was separated from his people, but then it was the black men who rallied around him. You know, black people are always going to support you in, in what they do. So just don't be afraid to, to stand up for whatever it is you believe in. I mean, if we take it back to when people started to have interracial marriages, there were people who had to take the heat for that. There were people who had to stand for somebody. You had to stand for what you believed in. Not everybody <laughs> stood with you. And some people came along after years. It took them a long time to jump on that bandwagon. Some will never. But as long as you stand in solidarity with somebody and you say, I'm in it, I'm in it with you. How I'm going to ride this wave with you. That's all people ask. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that was a powerful moment right there with Kimberly and Antonio and Justin, and Gael. I thank them so much for taking the time to be able to uh, sit down with me and allow me to be asked open and vulnerable questions. And I thank them and appreciate them uh, for their uh, rawness and their real answers uh, that help the conversation be able to move forward during these um, times that we're living in. Uh, I just really appreciate that a lot. If you have not get a chance to see that whole video, please take a moment and, pe and, and watch through that video. Uh, I, we were able to just have a conversation about some of the things that are going on and get answers and viewpoints and perspectives from different age groups, different generations, and be able to look at that. Well, not right now is my privilege to introduce my wife back to teach this week. This is not just any Sunday, but it's a special Sunday because today is her birthday and she has agreed to teach this morning uh, uh, going forth on her birthday. So if you're out and about today and you have a few moments, send her a text and wish her happy birthday because this is Karen Rowland's birthday today. And Karen, I'm so happy and privileged that you agreed to do this today. You are a blessing in my life and in our family's life. And I know you're a blessing to everyone whenever you come on this broadcast to teach. So everybody, without further ado, the rock of our family, the rock of the Roland family. Here's my wife, Karen Roland. Good morning. Um, I'm going to bring a word to you that I feel that God has laid on my heart for such a time as this. But before I begin, let me just share with you regarding the recent and current events happening as they relate to racism, police brutality, prote protesting, rioting, and looting. I want you to know that I hear the concerns and expressions of hopelessness in people who look like me. I hear it in people who do not look like me. I want you to know that racism is as old as time. 
Racism is real, a resounding yes. Racism is systemic, yes. Racism is physical, yes. Racism is social. Racism is emotional or mental. Racism is spiritual, absolutely yes. Because racism is a sin problem whether we think so or not. Racism is my problem. Racism is your problem. See, I know what it's like to be discriminated against. I know what it's like to be followed as I shop in department stores. I know what it's like to be graded unfairly because the expectation was that I was not as smart as the white students in my class. I know what it's like to have white faculty members consistently go above me for any requests that they need my approval as a department chair. Yet, my response has always been to be careful to not play into the expected failures, but to rise above, take the high road, educate myself, and continue performing with the highest standards that consistently amaze others. Is it difficult at times? Absolutely. But I know a sauce. I know a man that always puts me first because I always put him first. I know the God, my God, the almighty God, El Shaddai. How might we address racism? How, how might we make a change in the evils of racism? Will it take a genuine or sincere apology? Yes. Will it require more than this? Absolutely. I can honestly say that my response to any difficult or unexpected situation that I find myself in is to worry at first but ultimately pray and trust God to be in control. I know this sounds so simple for such a heavy and burdensome ordeal of racism in its most ugliest form. Let us all stop and listen, and at the same time do our part in forgiving, accepting, loving, and doing. See, it only takes one little spark to get a fire started or going. So let's start the fire of forgiveness. Let's start the fire of accepting. Let's start the fire of loving. Let's start the fire of change. Wendy Atkinson has sang a beautiful song for us on Mother's Day about the goodness of God. If there ever is a time that we need to hear and be encouraged about God's goodness, about his faithfulness, it is now. Join me and worship with Wendy as she sings the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful And all my the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, darkest night. 
You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you so much, Wendy, for such a beautiful song, for such a great song, for such a timely song. Let us all remember that God is good and in him there is only goodness and only faithfulness. So during these troublesome times that we're going through, remember his goodness. Outlast his faithfulness will outlast any of the crises that we're experiencing today. So Wendy, thank you so much. Um, I um, Once I found out that I would be speaking, it was about maybe about two weeks, two or three weeks ago, I started thinking about what topic I want to talk on, I want to share. Uh, and my mind immediately went to um, addressing emotional uh, or mental issues um, and how to tie those in with spiritual issues. And for whatever reason, it just didn't sit with me. And so I believe that the topic that I have for today, that uh, God really gave that to me because I started looking and I said, you know what? We are truly in a spiritual war. We're in a spiritual warfare. And that was before the, the, riot, the rioting even started, the protesting even started. And so that's why I'm saying I know the Holy Spirit gave this to me for such a time as this. So I want to share with you um, the topic, if I had to pick a topic, weapons for spiritual warfare. Because I really do believe we are in... Um, Daily, we're in a warfare uh, or we're in a war, and it truly is spiritual in nature because 2 Corinthians 10 uh, verses 3 all the way to 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, or they're not earthly, but they're mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So that's kind of my guiding um, scripture for today. Have you ever faced a situation or crisis? That was difficult, but you simply just didn't know what to do. Even as I talk to individuals today um, about what's going on, the issue of police brutality or racism, um, especially those that are of college age, younger, young adults, and the response is always, I'm really mad, I'm angry, I feel like I need to be doing more than what I'm doing. Uh, and, and that's because you're, you, you're in a situation where there really is a crisis. And so if you've been in a situation, or if you're currently going through a situation like that, 
I'm telling you, or even if you haven't, you will experience it. So going through a difficult situation could be with what's happening today, with a family member, with a spouse, with parents, with children, with neighbors, with your employer. It's difficult. What do we do when we face these moments in life? What do we do when we just don't know what to do? Let me share with you the story of King Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament. He gives us a picture of what we can actually do when what we can actually do when we simply just do not know what to do. We learn from the story of Jehoshaphat just what our weapons are for when we're fighting a spiritual warfare. So bear with me because I want to read um, the entire um, story about it. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. Second Chronicles chapter 20, and it starts from verse 1 and goes all the way up to 30. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, with some of the uh, Mennonites came to war, to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told him, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazaron, in Tamar. So along Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he, pro he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of uh, Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nation. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can stand, withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in a sanctuary for you, for your name, say, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territories you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. So see how they're repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. Jehaziel was the prophet. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. So Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Verse 20 says, Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. 
After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat anointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the end of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, where they praised the Lord. This is why it's called the Valley of Barakah to this very day. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps, trumpets. The fear of the Lord came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the armies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. So what are the weapons that King Jehoshaphat used? His weapons were not natural, but they, in actuality, they were supernatural. They were spiritual. So which brings me to the first weapon that King Jehoshaphat did, and that's prayer. When you are faced with a crisis, when you are faced in a difficult situation where you don't know what to do, or you seem almost as if you, um, you, you're just frozen as to what to do, like I said, there are times when I face situation, yes, I worry at first, but then I remember that my faith and my trust is in God. So like Jehoshaphat, the first weapon, prayer. Prayer, prayer should always be your first weapon. Go to God first. Ask God what to do. Why? Because he controls all things. He's almighty God. He's El Shaddai. The Most High God, El Elyon. So go to God first. King Jehoshaphat, like us, his initial human reaction, what was that? He panicked or he was fearful. However, he didn't stay there. He did not stay there. He didn't let his fear defeat him because he set himself, as the Word of God says, set himself to seek the Lord. And then he, to add to that, he proclaimed a fast. Not only did Jehoshaphat pray, but he also called on his people to pray. He called on the entire nation. He says, we're in a difficult, tough situation. We need to pray. So he called corporate prayer. There is power when God's people unite in prayer for one purpose. I'm going to say it again. There is power when God's people unite in prayer for one purpose. When COVID-19 first became really um, known in, in the Bahamas, when it began to really affect um, the Bahamas, we, it hit us before it actually hit the Bahamas. And when it did and the country began to shut down, my family on my mother's side decided that as a family, we were going to pray. We were going to go to the Lord in prayer. Now, I have a number of ministers of the gospel um, in my family on my mother's side. And so that was not uncommon. But they decided as a family, or I should say we decided as a family, um, that what we were going to do, we were going to hold a 24-hour prayer 
That's all day, one day, 24 hours. And so um, the elders in the family decided that, okay, we're going to open it up to anyone who um, wants to be a part of it. And so each family member volunteered to take two hour segments, two hour segments, and it was um, done through WhatsApp where everyone can join in, um, can call in and listen and record it on WhatsApp. And I decided I took the time from 4 to 6 a.m. And it started from midnight and it went until midnight the next day, 24 hours. And there were some situations that were going on in the country, in, in our family, that we decided that we would also include that in our prayer. Not only did we pray for um, the effects of COVID-19, um, that God would intervene, but we also begin to um, pray for needs within the family. And during this time, my brother was um, unexpectedly was hospitalized and then was taken into um, ICU. Uh, and so during this time, it, he had to have emergency surgery and was in ICU. And once that became known, we, we sent it uh, onto what we call the prayer line and prayed. And I want you to know that God healed my brother. He's now home. He's doing well. Um, but when God's people unite, come together and pray for one purpose, it's amazing what can happen. It's amazing what can happen. So Jehoshaphat knew exactly what to do. He set his face before God, called a proclaim a fast for himself, and then called his people to do the same. We're in a situation where we need to pray, saints of God. We need to pray. And, and you may say, oh, we can pray later because we're angry right now. Give it to God. There is nothing that has caught God by surprise. Nothing that catches him by surprise. And so prayer will do more for you than what you think it'll do. It's amazing what can happen. Matthew 21, 22 says, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So if we want to see a change in racism, systemic racism, meaning that it's deeply ingrained in this country, if we want to see a change in systemic racism, take you to the Lord in prayer. I know it sounds simple, but I'm telling you, I live my life on this principle. Whatever I face, take it to the Lord in prayer. And it's amazing the things that God will do. may not happen when you think it should or when you want it to. God knows and he controls all things and we just have to trust him. If his word says, whatever I ask in faith, he will do it, then I've got to stand on on that promise. I get to stand on his word and say, okay, God, this is going to happen. Once you have prayed and have unshakable faith in God, knowing that no weapon formed against you will prosper. If you know that, I promise you God is going to be, if God before me set your face, set your heart, set your, um, be very determined to say, if God before me, who can be against me? Always be on God's side. Because he'll be on your side as well. If your situation makes you so fearful, so oppressed, so burdened down that you cannot pray or you do not have the words to put it, um, to pray, to, to be able to understand it in your natural language, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then use your heavenly language. Use it because sometimes those words don't always come to so God, this is just so much. I don't know what to do. Use your heavenly language. Exercise your, your gift. Exercise your heavenly language. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayer for all believers everywhere. I mean, there are times I'll be driving in my car going to work and I'll be praying in the Spirit. Can't tell you what I'm praying for, what I'm, but just know that I need to pray. I need to pray. So when the words, the natural words do not come, let me encourage you to be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to baptize you and give you the heavenly, His heavenly language. And God will do it. 
during your prayer, you may sense the need to fast as well. And if that happens, just go right ahead and do it. It'll be just all right. Can understand when Queen Esther heard about the impending destruction of her people, what did she do? She decided that she was going to pray, but she also said, I'm going to fast. And then she went, she told her cousin, I need you to do the same thing and tell all of my people, I need them to do the same thing because we're going to pray and we're going to fast. Sometimes things become so heavy for you. Got to pray. He says, God, I need more than just praying. I need more than that. I get to fast. Even Jesus said that there are some things come out only by prayer and fasting. So there's a need. If there's a need to fast, go ahead and do it. Your, but your first weapon should be prayer. Go to God in prayer. Weapon number two, worship. That should be your second weapon. Why? Because worship tells God just how great he is. Tells God exactly what he means to you. It's communing directly with God. If only we could realize, we can begin to realize, if only we can begin to realize the awesome power of praise and worship, it would actually transform our lives. It will transform our churches. God lives in our praises. You may wonder why when you sing, why situation seems to change, why the atmosphere seems to change. Because what you've done, you've welcomed the presence of the Lord in your life. You have welcomed the presence of the Lord in your situation. So that's why worship should be a weapon for you when you're facing difficult situations because God inhabits the praises of his people. He lives in the praises of his people. He dwells in the praises of his people. So praise sets the atmosphere for us to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit right in our midst. Sets the atmosphere. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. That's what King David said. He said, I will enter his courts with praise. And then he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. King David knew the power, the importance of worship. King Jehoshaphat did not lift one sword. He and his men didn't have to waste one sword against this vast army that came in. What did they do? They sang. All they did, they just sang. All the people did was worship and praise God, and their enemies ended up fighting each other, turned against each other. Je Je Jehoshaphat and Judah came out to take up the spoils after the army had done what they did to each other, killed each other. So when the enemy comes up against you, pull out your weapon of worship. Confuse him. He's not expecting you to do that. Pull out your weapon. Why? Because you give God the you give God the right. You give God the invitation to say, come on, come in my midst. Come in the presence of this mess. Come in the presence of this situation, God. That's the power of worship. The enemy does not expect you to be praising and worshiping God. He expects you to be crying, to be miserable, to be angry, to be tearing the place up. But use your weapon, spiritual weapon of worship. Confuse or ambush the enemy. Because our eyes are no longer focused on our crisis, but then it becomes focus on God. El Shaddai, the Almighty God. So we ought to praise the Lord before the battle. We need to praise him during the battle and then praise him after the battle for the victory. This is how I fight my battle. That's a song that you know we, we sing at church. This is how I fight my battles. And that's worship. Learn to fight God. Learn, learn to fight your battles or allow God to fight your battles by worship, using your weapon of worship. Says when I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. If you know that and, and, and you're aware of that, you, you invite the Holy Spirit to come in. Which brings us to our third weapon. And that third weapon is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God, and at the same time, listening to godly wisdom, godly advice. 
uh, just as important. And why I say godly advice as well helps because you know that the godly advice comes from people who spent their time in the Word of God and who knows the Word of God. Because you may not know where to look or where to go, but they may be able to instruct you, instruct you or provide you with God, godly advice, give you godly wisdom. One of our greatest weapons when we are actively engaged, especially when we're actively in the middle of warfare, spiritual warfare is the word of God. We must, we must let God speak to us through his word. That's why we have it. That's why we have his word. As we seek God in prayer and we look to God for guidance, I promise you he will give us an answer. I'm not telling you something that I've read about. I'm telling you something that I know about, that I have experienced. God has been too good to me and have brought me out of too many situations that I know it took only his hand to deliver me. So knowing the word of God is important. Following King Jehoshaphat's prayer, what did God do? He sent a word of hope. And how did he do that? Through the prophet Jehaziel. He sent the prophet and the prophet told them, the battle's not yours, it belongs to God. Put your focus on God. He'll take care of it. So for us to defeat the enemy in spiritual warfare, we must study the word of God diligently. Know the word of God. I cannot encourage you in that. When Jesus was in the wilderness, what did he do? He used the word against the enemy. He used the word against Satan, and Satan eventually just left him alone and said, Oh, can't catch him, because Jesus knew the word. Use the word of God against the enemy. When he comes to you, say, well, didn't God say, mm -mm, the word of God says this and not that. Because there will be times when people are going to tell you, well, if you're a Christian, you'll do this. Got to know the word. You've got to know the word of God. Like I said, when I had, when I was in studying in, in school and I had a student, uh, um, one of my fellow students looked at me and said, I can't believe someone as intelligent as you believe in God. And my response was, I can't believe someone as intelligent as you not believe in God. And it shut him up because he didn't expect that I would say that. Got to be intelligent if you believe in God. Should be. So it's important. Christians n know that the word of God and how to use it is a big threat to the enemy, big threat to the enemy, because in that way, he can't deceive you, he can't destroy you when you use the word of God. Ephesians 2, 6 says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What's this mean? This means that we're kings and queens and priests with Jesus Christ. You gotta know that, how would you know that? unless you know his word. So as such, it's important for you to understand this. We have the authority and we have the right to rule right here within our, right? God gave us that authority. He gave us that authority. Satan is the one who's a trespasser. When, once you get an understanding of that, that he should not be messing with your family. He should not be in your home because you didn't invite him. He's the trespasser. So therefore, you have the divine right and authority to expel him. Speaking with a lady this week whose daughter was really being oppressed by the enemy. It was just wreaking havoc in, in their home. There was no sleep going on, nothing. And, and uh, I was told by another friend um, to call me and, and let me you know, just kind of talk to her. And I said to her, and it was an eye opening, an eye opener for her. I said, you can tell the enemy get out your house. He's not invited in your house. I said, God's given you that authority to say to him, get out. You have no place in here in the name of Jesus. You have got to leave. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that was an eye opener for her. Because she didn't realize the authority that she had. She was just going, please pray for me. Please pray for my daughter. Please. I said, you've got, you, you can talk to him. Don't get out. He has no place. God has given us that authority to do that. You can 
You can only know this. And how, and how do I know this? Because I know the word of God. And that's why I shared with you what Ephesians 2 says. That God, he raised Jesus from, from the dead. And then he placed us. He told us that um, he sees us with, with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we are kings and queens, priests if you must. Peter calls us a holy nation. So as Christians, understand, understand your authority when it comes to spiritual warfare. It's really important. When we know and we speak the word of God, what do we do? We invite him to move on our behalf. We invite God to move on our behalf into that situation to tear down every stronghold that the enemy has. Pulling or tearing down what Satan has done or what he's brought up against us or against our family. So it's time to decree and to declare to the enemy that the blood of Jesus is against him. Song we used to sing a long time ago, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Hey, you speak the word, of, you can even sing the word to him. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus in and of itself is a very powerful weapon. Very powerful. The blood of Jesus brings cleansing, sanctification, protection, healing, deliverance, all combined. All combined. So when it is said, when it's all said and done, we're overcomers in this life. Why? Because Jesus has overcame for us. He's already overcome for us. And our lives are hidden in Christ with God. So as I close, let me share. No enemy or no obstacle can touch our souls. So let me end by saying, go ahead and give God the glory. So when you're in any, any sort of spiritual warfare, any tough situation you find yourself in, such as what's going on today, use your spiritual weapon. Use the weapon of knowing the word of God. Cannot emphasize that enough. Use the weapon of God's word. Because his word is what he will stand by. Use the weapon of worship. It's very important. Weapon of worship. And use your weapon of prayer. Direct communication with God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you and your family. May he give you peace in the midst of this turbulent time. May no evil come near your dwelling. May your homes, your family, your children, your extended family, may they be protected by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who's been victorious in defeating the enemy. God bless you.